This is reinforcement learning with OpenAI Gym for Mechie 6397 Learning Meet Systems and Controls for uh, Spring 2021. My name is Subin Varghese and I'm joined with Mary Batar for this presentation. Recent advancements in deep learning has allowed for rapid progress in the field of reinforcement learning, but a major concern is the instability uh, shown in these reinforcement learning algorithms. As such, this project uh, attempts to explore um, the effects of these various reinforcement learning algorithms in these uh, different environments. We implement several reinforcement learning algorithms to these three main environments. Uh, the first is the mountain car uh, continuous environment, the next is the bipedal walker environment, and finally we apply it to the most difficult environment um, of these three, which is the humanoid environment. This is a quick overview of the um, reinforcement learning algorithms that we have implemented. Um, the first is the deep deterministic policy gradient. Uh, this expanded upon the original deep Q learning algorithm and it allows it to operate in the continuous action space. Uh, TD3 and SAC um, improve upon uh, this DDPG. Um, TD3 introduces a delay in the policy updates to help reduce the uh, large variance. Um, and it also does a uh, clipped double Q learning where um, two Q learning, uh, two Q uh, and networks are used during training and the uh, smaller value of the two are used in the uh, actual training. Uh, SAC also does this clipped double Q learning, but it also introduces this entropy uh, regularization this um, this allows for um, it, it rewards increases in um, entropy um, if a state has a higher entropy, and uh, this naturally allows for more exploration. Um, while these three are the first three are off policy algorithms, this last one uh, proximal policy optimization is an on policy algorithm, meaning it uses the experience um, obtained using the current policy algorithm or the, per, the current policy uh, network. Um, PPO also, also directly optimizes uh, policy with respect to the uh, expected rewards, which is uh, different from these um, first three algorithms. The first environment that we'll look at is the uh, mountain car continuous environment, where this cart attempts to uh, climb up this hill, but it doesn't have enough power to directly climb it. So it needs to learn how to build momentum and then uh, use what power it does have to um, achieve, to reach this goal. Um, here we have some results using the DDPG uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, we can see at 10,000 steps that it just tends to rock back and forth a little bit. At uh, 50,000, it really starts to uh, pick up a bit more, but by the time we reach 3 million time steps, the cart is able to um, reach just enough momentum to reach the goal. The next environment that we'll look at is the uh, bipedal walker environment, where this uh, walker you can see with uh, in purple with the, these two legs attempts to um, traverse this environment, and the environment will uh, continuously change at the um, end of each episode. Um, you can see how it, the obstacles as well as the, um, the overall landscape changes um, as each episode terminates. Uh, we have results for both the DDPG and TD3. Uh, over here we have 10k uh, time steps and over here is at 3 million and finally uh, TD3 is over here with, with that another um, 3 million. We can see at only uh, 3 million that TD3 um, is kind of stuck at this local optima and it just uh, kneels over here. By further increasing the time steps um, and training time for both the DDPG and TD3, we can see how DDPG is able to uh, move much further in the environment, um, especially compared to the previous results, while TD3 is still um, stuck at this, um, the initial area and isn't able to progress much further. So the final environment that we moved on to is the humanoid environment in which we evaluated all of our algorithms on. 
The goal of the humanoid environment is to make a 3D bipedal robot walk forward as fast as possible without falling over. And it gains, the robot itself, the agent, gains a larger reward for this, but it loses points if it falls down. Um, and so in the image on the left, we're showing the starting position, the robot starts in a standing up position. And from this, its, it's goal is to learn to stay standing up and continue walking forward. So our initial test was to train these models with the default hyperparameters that were a part of the code that we were using for the algorithms. We trained three algorithms, PPO, DDPG, and TD3, for 60 million time steps, which is a, a few days of training. And we used the default hyperparameters, which are listed in the table on this presentation. Um, so the number of layers and the layer size and the activation function, they all relate to the policy network architecture for these algorithms. The default number of layers was two. The layer size, which is the number of neurons, was 64. The noise variance was 0.1, and the activation function was ReLU. And looking at the video results below, we can see that TD3 was the main successful algorithm um, in this case. We can see that the robot continues to walk forward throughout the duration of the video without falling over. On the other hand, PPO and DEPG, they, um, PPO in particular does take one step but then falls over, and DDPG itself is, fails to even take one step. So what we, would, what we gathered from these results was that TD3 was the most successful in terms of performance. And as we moved on to our next set tests in which we varied hyperparameters, we really focused um, on TD3 and, and trying to improve the good performance that it already showed. So on this slide, we're showing the hyperparameters that we varied to improve performance of the algorithms. Um, in particular, from the last slide, we had focused, as I've mentioned, particularly on TD3. And we also came across SAC. Um, which SAC is similar to TD3 in that it does have two Q functions. However, TD3 is deterministic, which is why it has the, the noise variance term, because you need to add in noise into the system in order to encourage the agent to explore uh, new actions. But SAC, on the other hand, has an, uh, an entropy term, which introduces randomness to the system making it stochastic and eliminating, eliminating the need for that noise term. Um, so the hyperparameters that we chose to focus on are the number of layers, layer size, noise variance, and activation function. For number of layers, we looked at um, 20, 10, and 5, which in comparison to the default, which was 2. Layer size, we looked at 128 and 512 in comparison to the default of 64. In noise variance, we tried to decrease, for one case, we tried decreasing to um, a noise variance of 0.05 in comparison to the default of 0.1. In activation function, we looked at leaky ReLU in addition to the default of ReLU. Here we are showing the results of the three SA3 tests that we carried out. Right away, we can see that for all three tests, the agent was unsuccessful in learning how to walk forward. In particular, for test one and test three, the robot agent actually just starts jumping in place. And this behavior of jumping in place is actually reflected in the plots of the episode mean reward over the time steps shown below. So for, for looking at test one, the plot of the episode mean reward with the time steps, we can see at around two and a half million time steps of training, the mean reward drops um, and plateaus off at a certain value. And at this instance is where we see that the robot starts jumping in place. With test three, it this behavior occurs at around 1 million time steps when the mean reward plateaus off at a certain value. When looking at test two in comparison to the others, we see an improvement in performance in the, in the fact that learning does not fail with the robot jumping in place and the mean reward is continuing to increase. Although it does fluctuate up and down, it is still making an improvement in increasing. When we compare test one to test two, they do vary in the activation function, and test one has leaky ReLU activation function. So from this, we can gather that from the poor performance of test one, using leaky ReLU was not a beneficial um, activation function in the case for SA3. And when we compare test two to test three, 
we see that they differ in the number of layers and how deep that the net policy neural network architecture is. So test two has 10 layers while test three has five layers. So we can gather from these results that having a deeper network is, is bit more beneficial in that um, performance does improve even though test two does not show the robot learning to walk, it does have better performance. And so future tests would need to be done with deeper networks in order to see how much more we could improve the performance for this algorithm. Moving on to the results for TD3, we had one instance in which the robot failed to learn to walk forward. And again, in this case, it did end up just jumping in place. And this occurred when the leaky ReLU activation function was used in comparison to ReLU, and this is also reflected in the plot of the mean reward over the time steps. Um, we can see in the plot that around in around one and a half million time steps, this, the mean reward ends up stopping and dropping at one, one value at around negative 50, and in this case, this is where the robot agent had started jumping in place. So moving on here, we are showing the results of the three successful TD3 tests that we had. In this case, the ReLU activation function was used for all three of these cases. And we can see the robot agent continuing to walk forward without falling over in, in the videos. Um, the main difference in the performance of these tests is how fast the robot is walking. So test one is walking at the slowest speed and we have test four being the fastest and the better performer of the three. When we compare test one to tests to the other two tests, we can see that test one has um, a deeper network and that it has 20 layers and it has a smaller network size with 128 neurons. But test three and test four have five layers with 512 neurons and they are the better performers. So we can gather from these results that having um, a deeper network is not, is not necessarily be beneficial in, but rather having a wider network is, is more beneficial in this case. When we compare test three to test four, um, test three was the test in which we had decreased the noise variance to 0.05. And because it is slower than test four in, in speed with the robot, um, this shows that decreasing noise variance is, is not beneficial in this case. And so in a future test, it would be important to actually increase the noise variance and see on the other end what, how that would affect the performance of the speed of the robot. One of the things to take away from, the, from these videos is the stance at which the robot is walking with. We can see it's walking in an awkward position with its knees bent and its back arched backwards towards the floor. This is not an ideal walking position. And um, in, and this is one of the areas that would need to be looked into as well in order to um, gain better improve, gain improvement in how the robot walks. And also with the three plots on the bottom, these do show, these do reflect in terms of how, of the speed of the robot. So for example, test for the plot of the mean reward with the number of time steps, we can see that the, that the mean reward um, was larger and grew at a faster rate in comparison to the other two. So here on this slide, we are showing the progression of performance as we increase the number of time steps or training time. On this slide, the videos here are from test four of TD3, which as we had just shown on the previous slide, was the best performer out of all the tests that we had carried out. And so essentially during training, after every million time steps, we would save the model and we would generate a video based off of the results of that saved model. And what we can see here is as the number of time steps increases, we can see that improvement in performance, particularly with speed. So there's a clear distinction with 1 million time steps and 2 million time steps in which the robot does learn to walk forward without falling over. And then after 2 million time steps, as we increase the number of time steps, um, we can see this, the speed does improve greatly, particularly as we get to 8 million, the robot is walking much, much faster than it was earlier, for example, at 2 million time steps. 
So what we have gathered from our results is that the reinforcement learning algorithms that we have tested thus far are sensitive to the hyperparameters used in complex environments. So we have seen, for example, um, each algorithm reacts differently to different hyperparameters, and any small change in a hyperparameter could reflect a large change in performance. In particular, when we had trained um, to 60 million time steps, TD3 was a good candidate for further hyperparameter tuning, as it had achieved the highest episode mean reward when trained to 60 million in comparison to PPO and DDPG. And so because of that, we further went in to a zoned in on TD3 in order to try and improve performance through hyperparameter tuning. And what we found was by varying the network architecture and the variance of added noise, we were able to improve the performance of TD3 significantly. We saw that with a wider network rather than a deeper network, the performance of TD3 was greater. And we saw that with an increase in noise variance, it also reflected an improvement in performance as well. In conclusion, from our experimentation for complex environments, these reinforcement learning algorithms can be very unstable and sensitive to hyperparameters. We had seen this in the case of some of our failed tests in which the robot agent ended up just jumping in place. But what we also did see was proper hyperparameter tuning was key to achieve good results. For example, in the, in the case of TD3, we were able to improve, improve the performance and, and the speed of the robot um, through hyperparameter tuning. And so for future tests, it is key to look at different hyperparameter combinations in order to ch achieve the best combination for optimal performance for these algorithms. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening.